Hello folks, this is Jörg Lissmann again from YouTube channel Jogler66. I will now today continue the reading on the book Rulers of Evil, Useful Knowledge of Governing Bodies, read, wrote by F. Tupper Saucy, somewhere in the 90s. We will start out with chapter 3, that is called Marginalizing the Bible. I think this is... Um, were quite a short chapter, it only has about three pages, but it's going back to ex exactly what the Roman Catholic Church thinks of the Bible. And if you want to know what the Roman Catholic Church actually thinks of the Bible, then you should go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. In volume 12, page 496, is a quote that reads, quote, the supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. It is unhistorical. End quote. And I think this little quote already says more than enough of what the Roman Catholic Church actually thinks about the Word of God. Of course, because the Roman Catholic Church has another God. They have the Pope, who is God on earth. And uh, to confirm that, I advise you to go to a website that is called remnantofgod.org. And there you have a search engine. Type in the word blasphemy and see how blasphemy is defined in the Bible. And compare that to the doings and readings and wordings of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope especially. When, for example, there it is stated, the Pope is Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. So, that in the continuation of Rulers of Evil, we are now going to marginalizing the Bible, is a very important and deep subject that goes much deeper than just the reading of this book here. But I will continue now reading this book, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Okay, marginalizing the Bible. Every ruled society has some form of Holy Scripture. The Holy Scriptures of Caesarean Rome were the prophecies and ritual directions contained in the ten Sibylline Gospels and Virgil's Aeneid. The Aeneid is implied that every Roman's duties, uh, duty was to sacrifice his individuality, as heroic Aeneas had done, to the greater glory of Rome and Pontifex Maximus just a little insert for me here. It implied that every Roman's duty was to sacrifice his individuality. What are we looking at in the world today? We are all made one. We are going back to the status of the Tower of Babel from a few thousand years ago, the so-called One World Order, New World Order that they want to have. We are all the same. It's going to be all communism where there is no individuality, no private property, nobody has the right of free speech or even the free conscience. This is what this little sentence is all about. I'm going to read it again. The Aeneid implied that every Roman's duty was to sacrifice his individuality, as heroic Aeneas had done, to the greater glory of Rome and Pontifex Maximus. The Sibyllines, borrowing from Isaiah's much earlier prophecy of Jesus Christ, prophesied that when Caesar Augustus succeeded his uncle Julius as Pontifex Maximus, he would rule the world as, quote, Prince of Peace, Son of God, unquote. Augustus would issue in a, quote, unquote, new world order, as indeed he did. So you see, the term New World Order is not that new, and it certainly is not like Wikipedia sa states, a conspiracy theory. The Sibyllines and the Aeneid were so beloved by the government priests that they were considered part of the Roman Constitution. The same scriptures were made part of the United States Constitution when the mottos Aloit Captis and Novus Ordo Seclorum taken from the Aeneid and the Sibyllines, respectively, were incorporated by the Act of July 28, 1782, into the Great Seal of the United States. 
Well, not only the great seal of the United States, but you can check that by uh, looking, having a look at your one dollar bill that you probably have somewhere in your wallet. And there you will see the same mottos standing there. Novus Ordo Seclorum and Anuit Ceptus. And now you know where that is taken from. And when you see that and read that, then ask yourself, is that country that I'm living in that issues this fiat Federal Reserve notes with these old Roman Etruscan mottos on it, Anuit Ceptus and Novus Ordo Seclorum, is that possibly a Protestant country? Continue reading. The Sibyllines and the Aeneid were open only to priests and certain privileged persons. The people learned their sacred content by the trickle-down of priestly retelling. When the Old and New Testaments were adopted as the Empire's official sacred writings, they, too, were given to the exclusive care of the priests. And in accord with Roman tradition, the people learned sacred content from discretionary retelling. This had to be for the sake of the Holy Empire, for should the people acquire biblical knowledge, they would know that Pontifex Maximus was not a legitimate Christian entitlement. Knowing this, they would not bow to his supremacy. The Empire could collapse. And so the monarchical Roman Church forcibly suppressed the Bible's intelligent reading. This is why the millennium between Constantine and Gutenberg is known as the Dark Ages. And for the people who do not know who Gutenberg was, he was the inventor of the printing press. And with the inventing of the printing press, and could books be spread far more and to far more people and f much faster than in the Dark Ages, the time before that. People got all of a sudden literate. They had the possibility to read. Not the Bible in the first place, but later on also the Bible. And this is exactly what this chapter is dealing with. So, I continue reading. Sprinkled throughout the Empire, however, were isolated Christian assemblies who had preserved scripture from the days of the early church. For them, the Babel invited an ongoing personal communion with the creator of the universe. They lived by the writings of which Rome was so jealous. By the 13th century, these assemblies had grown so vibrant that Pope Gregory IX declared unauthorized Bible study a heresy. He further decreed that, quote, it is the duty of every Catholic to persecute heretics, unquote. To manage the persecution, Gregory established the Pontifical Inquisition. The Inquisition treated the slightest departure from the life of the community as proof of direct communion with the Bible or Satan. Either instance was a sin worthy of death. Cases were prosecuted according to a strict routine. First, the inquisitors would enter a town and present their credentials to the civil authorities. In the Pope's name, they would require the governor's cooperation. Next, the local priest would be ordered to summon his congregation to hear the inquisitors preach against heresy, which was defined as anything the least bit opposed to the papal system. A brief grace period followed the sermon, wherein the people were given an opportunity to step forward and accuse themselves of crimes. Those who did were usually punished mildly. Later, the inquisit inquisitors would receive at their lodgings unverified accusations, guaranteeing in the Pope's name the anonymity of informants. Many innocent lives were ruined by false testimony. Trials were conducted arbitrarily and secretly by tribunals consisting of, inquisit of the inquisitors, their staff and their witnesses, all concealed under hoods. The accused were never told the charges against them, and they were forbidden to ask. No defense witnesses were permitted. The accused had but one option, to confess guilt and die. 
those who refused to confess and witness who balked at testifying were carried to the dungeon for torture sessions. Boys under 14 and girls under 12 were exempted. Inquisitors and executioners were commanded by papal edict to show no mercy. No acquittal was ever recorded. Every fully persecuted case ended in the death of the defendant and the forfeiture of his or her property. Since it was assumed, as an America forfeiture case since, cases since 1984, that the property was gained in sin, sometimes the property of family members for generations to come was forfeited. These forfeitures were paid out in expenses to the scribes and executioners, half of the remainder going to the papal treasury and half to the inquisitors. Although popes and inquisitors amassed great fortunes from the inquisition, its greatest beneficiary was and has been the Roman system. Now, I have to make a little remark here, because if you say, well, that inquisition how bad was it really? Was it really that bad as stated here? No, it was much worse than I state right here. And for that I would advise you to get the book. I don't know if you can... Uh, yeah, you can get it as a PDF online, uh, but you can also buy the book via Amazon or any other platform. Fox's Book of Martyrs. And there are records in, and you don't need to read any horror book by Stephen King or anything else like that. When you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I think your hair in the neck will stand up straight. The Inquisition was much worse than just the little thing that I just read here from that book. It's just unbelievable. And all this, I can assure you, is coming back. All this is coming back when the jubilee year that Pope Francis announced now in 2015 that will go from the 8th of December this until the 20th of November uh, next year 2016 have run out because that is an ultimatum to the Protestants to go back under the wings of Mother Rome. That's the idea of this jubilee year and we dealt with that in some of my um, broadcasts on Hour of the Truth so check the archives and uh, check the playlist on Hour of the Truth uh, for that information uh, if you want to. But really I can advise you, get that book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you will really see what this Inquisition was all about in that time. I'll continue reading now. The Inquisition was most effective against the isolated truth seeker in an ignorant community. Does that sound familiar to today's times? As communities became more literate, the Inquisition grew subtler. What brought literacy to communities was the epidemic of Bible reading made possible by the perfection of Johannes Gutenberg's invention of movable type. And that is already the end of this chapter. I told you, it was quite short. And uh, like I said, when Gutenberg invented um, the movable type, the printing press, as we say today, that brought literacy to the people and that brought knowledge to the people. And if the Roman Catholic Church is uh, there's anything they do not want, it is smart people that they cannot control because they have the guts to read and understand for their own. That is something the Roman Catholic Church does not want, and I hope I made this point clear in this, uh, in this chapter of Rulers of Evil. We will continue with uh, chapter 4, Rulers of Evil, called Medici Learning. Yeah, Medici Learning, you understood right. It's about the Medici family, yet that you probably heard about, or probably even didn't hear about, one of the richest families in the whole world. Okay, starting reading. Gutenberg chose the Bible to demonstrate movable type not so much that the common man might be brought nearer to God, but that he and his becker, Dr. Johannes Faust, might make a killing in the book trade. Prior to 1540, Bibles were so rare 
They were conveyed by deed like parcels of real estate. A Bible took nearly a year to make, commanding a price equal to ten times the annual income of a prosperous man. Johannes Gutenberg intended his first production, a folio edition of the 6th century Latin Bible, known as the Vulgate, to fetch manuscript prices. Dr. Faust discreetly sold it as a one-of-a-kind to kings, nobles and churches. A second edition in 1462 sold for as much as 600 crowns each in Paris, but sales were too sluggish to suit Faust, so he slashed prices to 60 crowns and then to 30. This put enough copies into circulation for church authorities to notice that several were identical. Such extraordinary uniformity being regarded as humanly impossible, the authorities charged that Faust had produced the Bible by magic. On this pretext, the Archbishop of Mainz had Gutenberg's shop raided and the fortune in counterfeit Bible seized. The red ink which, uh, with which they were embellished was alleged to be human blood. Faust was arrested for conspiring with Satan, but there is no record of any trial. Meanwhile, the pressman, who had been sworn not to disclose Gutenberg's secrets while in his service, fled the jurisdiction of Mainz and set up shops in their own. Uh, set up shops of their own. As paper manufacture improved, along with technical improvements in matrix cutting and typecasting, books began to proliferate. Most were editions of the Vulgate. In the decades following the Mainz raid, five Latin and two German Bibles were published. Translators busied themselves in other countries. An Italian version appeared in 1471, a Bohemian in 1475, a Dutch and a French in 1477, and a Spanish in 1478. As quickly as our generation has become computer literate, the Gutenberg generation learned to read books and careful readers found shocking discrepancies between the papacy's interpretation of God's word and the word itself. I have to insert here a little bit. This is exactly the same thing that is going on today. When you go to a church and listen to your preacher, your priest that preaches from the pulpit, and compare that what he teaches to the word of God, you will find discre discrepancies. Because they are teaching from the Roman Catholic Catechism, and that is not the Word of God in the Bible. And also, of course, in nowadays, you have to make very sure that you get an uncorrupted Bible, that you get the true Word of God. And that, in my personal opinion, is the 1611 authorized King James Version, and I do not use any other Bible than that one. All the other Bibles are corrupt. And there are, of course, a lot of people who say, but what about the Geneva Bible? You know, the Geneva and the King James have for more than 70% the same textus receptus as basis. That's fine. But why do people always turn to the Geneva Bible, or most of the people that I know at least, because of the footnotes. And what are the footnotes? Those are notes taken by men to interpret the Bible in their way. And what does God say in the Bible? The Bible is of no personal interpretation. And when you have a correct Bible, like the 1611 King James Bible, the Bible will always interpret itself so that you can fully understand it when you read it front to cover, front, front to back, cover to back, whatever you mean, when, I mean when, when you read it in whole, okay? The Bible will always explain itself. And, um, like I said here, as quickly as our generation has become computer literate, and remember, 40 years ago there were no PCs, 30 years ago they were very rare, 20 years ago they were a little bit in, and it's only the last 15 to 10 years that almost anybody has a computer. 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. So as quickly as our generation has become computer literate, 
the Gutenberg generation learned to read books, and careful readers found shocking discrepancies between the papacy's interpretation of God's word and God's word itself. In 1485, the Archbishop of Mainz issued an edict punishing unauthorized Bible reading with excommunication, confiscation of books and heavy fines. The great Renaissance theologian Desiderius Erasmus challenged the Archbishop by publishing in 1516 the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament. I uh, just have to make another little remark here. You know, I live in Belgium, not so far away from Bilvorde. That's the place where Tyndale got um, executed. And that is also the, uh, the place where Erasmus worked and did his translation work. And we have a lot of Erasmus schools and everybody and, uh, and, and, and things like that. And when today I go out on the streets here in Belgium and I ask people, do you know who Erasmus was? They have no idea. And he was a great Renaissance theologian called Desiderius Erasmus. And he challenged the Archbishop by publishing in 1516 the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament. Listen, the Greek New Testament, that was not written in Latin. That was not the Roman New Testament, that was the original Textus Receptus, that was the Greek New Testament. He addressed the anti-Bible mentality in his preface with these words, quote, I vehemently dissent from those who would not have private persons read the Holy Scriptures, nor have them translated into the vulgar tongues, as though either Christ thought, uh, taught such difficult doctrines that they can only be understood by a few theologians, or the safety of the Christian religion lay in ignorance of it. I should like all women to read the Gospel and the Epistles of Paul. Would they, would that they trans were translated into all languages, so that not only the Scotch and Irish, but Turks and Saracens might be able to read and know them." Unquote. A Catholic monk named Martin Luther, against the advice of his superiors, plunged into the New Testament of Erasmus. He was shocked by the absence of scriptural authority for so many church traditions. Of the seven church sacraments only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper, were grounded in scripture. The remaining five, confirmation, absolution, ordination, marriage and extreme unction were the inventions of post-biblical councils and decrees. Luther found no scriptural mandate for celibacy of monks and nuns, or for pilgrimages and the veneration of sacred relics. The Church taught that prayer, good works and regular participation in the sacraments might save man from eternal damnation. Luther found this to be opposed to the teaching of Scripture. According to Scripture, only one thing can save man from the consequences of his sins. God's grace, and that alone. Now, let me insert here a little bit, when we are reading about the seven sacraments. <coughs> Sorry. Five remaining sacraments that he said, that are not Bible-founded, are confirmation, absolution, ordination, extreme unction, and marriage. Why do you need a marriage license? Why do you need a marriage license? Because Rome allows you then to marry. God never asked for a marriage license. What was a biblical marriage like? In the Bible, a marriage was done when a man and a woman were laying together, having sexual intercourse. That was their marriage. And um, there are some uh, very interesting um, broadcasts I did with Tom Press where he mentions things like this. So, really, really interesting. 
what we call today marriage, going to a priest and having all, uh, going to a priest and uh, exchanging rings, this is all Roman tradition. It is nothing else. It has nothing to do with the Bible. A marriage is a convent between a man and a woman. It's a blood convent. It's a blood contract signed when the man goes into the a man goes into the woman for the first time and she loses her virginity. And that's why you can laugh about that, but that's why in the earlier times when two people got married and they had their first night together, they held out the bloody sheet to show everybody on the outside that the marriage was done, that it was consumed, and that she was a virgin before that. Well, try that in our days, okay? <clears throat> With the moral standards that we have today. But I think it is very important that you really get these remaining five sacraments. They are only within the Church. Confirmation, absolution, ordination, marriage, and extreme unction. And when Luther read this, of course, uh, I guess that also gave him a little bit the idea to nail his 95 Theses at the Wittenberg Church door in uh, 1517. Okay, continue reading. The most explosive result of Luther's Bible reading was its attitude toward the papacy. Nowhere in Scripture could the passionate monk find that God had ordained an imperious Roman quote-unquote vicar of Christ to rule over a vast economy based on selling rights to do evil. These rights were called indulgences. They have been a church tradition since Pope Leo III had begun granting them in the year 800, payable in the money coined by Pope Adrian I in 1780. Indulgences were floated on the church's credibility, rather like government bonds are issued on the credibility of states today. In 1491, for example, Innocent the VII granted the seventh granted a uh, the twenty-year butter uh, butterbriefe indulgence. Butterbriefe means uh, butter letter, by which Germans could pay uh, twenty years of a gilder for the annual privilege of eating dairy products, even while meriting from fasting. The proceeds of the butterbriefe or butter letters went to build a bridge at Torgau. Rome's indulgence economy was as extensive as America's income tax system is today, and it was very bit as fueled by the people's trembling compliance, voluntarily to a presumption of liability. In 1515, Pope Leo X issued a bull of indulgences, authorizing letters of safe conduct to paradise and pardons for every evil imaginable. From a 25-cent purgatory release, the dead left purgatory, the instant one's coin hits the bottom of the indulgence salesman bucket, to a license so potent that it would excuse someone who had raped the Virgin Mary. For the payment of four ducats, one could be, give, one could be forgiven for murdering one's father. Sorcery was pardoned for six ducats. For robbing a church, the law could be relaxed for only nine ducats. Sodomy was pardoned for twelve ducats. Half the revenue from Leo's indulgences went to a fund for the build of St. Peter's Cathedral, and the other half to paying 40% interest, uh, interest rates on bank loans subsidizing the magnificent work of art and architecture, in which His Holiness was establishing Rome, as the cultural capital of the Renaissance. Historians have glorified Leo, whose father happened to be the great Florentine banker Lorenzo de' Medici, by marking the 16th century as, quote-unquote, the century of Leo X. Uh, now, there's a little printing error in the next paragraph, because it reads in early 1521, Martin Luther formally protested the indulgences, and that should read um, the 31st of October, 1517. So, you can take a note in there and change that for yourself. 
The 31st of October 1517, Martin Luther formally protested the indulgences record by nailing his famous 95 Theses upon indulgences to the door of the Catholic Church of Wittenberg. The Church was said to own a lock of the Holy Virgin's heir worth two million years of indulgences. Luther's Theses exhorted Christians, quote, to follow Christ, their head, through penalties, death and health, unquote, rather than purchase, quote, a false assurance of peace, unquote, from church indulgences salesmen. Leo had Luther arrested and detained for ten months in Wartburg Castle. While in custody, Luther managed to translate the Greek, the Greek New Testament of Erasmus into German. Its publication alarmed the broad uh, the broadest reaches of Roman authority. Daubigne, in his History of, Ref of the Reformation, tells us that, quote, ignorant priests shuddered at the thought that every citizen, nay, every peasant, would now be able to dispute with them on the precepts of our Lord, unquote. Meanwhile, Leo X died. The new Pope, Adrian VI, hardly eulogized Leo when confessing to the Diet of Nuremberg that, quote, for many years abominable things have taken place in the chair of Peter, abuses in spiritual matters, transgressions of the commandments, so that everything here has been wickedly perverted, unquote. Adrian died shortly after speaking these lines, to be succeeded by the cardinal who had been handling Martin Luther's case, all along, another Medici, Leo X's first cousin, Giulio de' Medici. Giulio took the papal name of Clement VII. Now, just another little remark here, and um, you can check out my second YouTube channel for that, where I will be uploading a read from Tom Fred, where he reads the book uh, A Woman Writes the Beast from Dave Hunt. And one of these videos will be called Apostolic Succession. Question mark, because the popes say that they are all ordained because of apostolic succession from Peter on. And when you see how the popes here already changed, and the one is the cousin of the other, and then the next from the Medici family becomes the next pope, is that really apostolic succession? Is that godly ordained succession of the so-called vicar of Christ on earth? Some questions people have to ask themselves while reading this, especially when they have gone through all this Catholic teaching all their lives. Okay, I continue. Giulio took the, the papal name Clement VII. Just as Leo X's corruption has ignited Luther, Clement VII's shrewdness determined how the Church would deal with the proliferation of Bibles. Clement was personally advised by the K.G. Niccolo Machiavelli, inventor of modern political science, and Cardinal Thomas Woolsey, Chancellor of England. Machiavelli and Woolsey opined that both printing and Protestantism could be turned to Rome's advantage by employing movable type, means the printing, yeah, to produce a literature that would confuse, diminish, and ultimately marginalize the Bible. Cardinal Woolsey, who would later found Christ Church College as uh, who would laut later found Christ Church College at Oxford, characterized the project as quote, to put learning against learning unquote. Against the Bible's learning, which demonstrated how man could have eternal life simply by believing in the facts of Christ's death and resurrection would be put the learning of the Gnostics. Gnosticism held out the hope that man could achieve everlasting life by doing good works himself. To put it secondly, Bible learning was Christ-centered. Gnostic learning was man-centered. Oh my dear, what do we have in this world today? It's all about man-learning, right? It's all about humanism psychology, psychiatry, all these things that come from man, Gnostic learning, learning from men, 
man center of learning, I am the center, I am God, this is all they teach today. You see that? You see how far back that goes? And that is absolutely opposed to Bible learning. Gnostic learning and Bible learning are opposed, and it was very profound that they call it to put learning against learning. I find this a very, very interesting paragraph in this book. Okay, I uh, continue. An enormous trove of Gnostic learning had been brought from the Eastern Mediterranean by agents of Clement VII's great-grandfather, Cosimo de' Medici. Suppressed since the Emperor Justinian had piously shut down the pagan colleges of Athens back in 529, these celebrated mystical, scientific and philo uh, philosophical scrolls and manuscripts flattered humanity. They taught that human intelligence was competent to determine truth from falsehood without guidance or assistance from any god. Since, as Protagoras put it, quote, man is the measure of all things, unquote, man could control all the living powers of the universe. If elected and initiated into the secret knowledge, or gnosis, man could master the Kabbalah, the, quote, royal science, unquote, of names, numbers, and symbols, to create his very own divinity. Cosimo de' Medici had stored huge quantities of this pagan material in his library in Florence. The Medici Library, whose final architect was Michelangelo, welcomed scholars favored by the papacy. These scholars, not surprisingly, soon began emulating the papacy and focusing more upon humanity than upon the Old and New Testaments. So extensive was the Medici Library's philosophical influence that even scholars today consider it the cradle of Western civilization. Martin Luther, seeing that learning against learning was the future for Christianity, voiced an appeal to the ruling classes in 1520, in which he wrote, rather prophetically, certainly if read today in 2015, Quote, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery, because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the holy scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. End quote. I found this very interesting and surely when you see it in the light of things that happened in schools, well, let's say from the late 60s on, uh, do you remember in the 90s that Columbine shooting? Um, I don't want to go into Sandy Hook because that was a hoax, but uh, the Columbine shooting was real. And these guys wore absolutely um, atheistic t-shirts, and there was one girl that she was asked if she believed in Jesus Christ, and when she said yes, they shot her. I mean, when you read this, what Luther here just said, and then see what your schools are today, and how they have deprived into what they are today, uh, drug dealing places, I mean, where does God reign in the school? And, uh, certainly in the public school. In private schools neither, because they're all Catholic, and there's no God in there. But in the public schools? So, I want you really to understand this, what Luther wrote in 1520, that's almost 500 years ago. And I want to make sure that you really understand this well, so I will read this again. Quote, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, 
They faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the holy scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. End quote. It was one thing to recommend learning against learning, and quite another to manage its multiple dimensions. Learning against learning amounted to no less than making war on the Bible. To wage such a war, the papacy needed a new priestly order of pious soldiers, conditioned to wield psychological weapons on a battlefield of human thought. But first, there had to be a general. The man chosen to lead the assault on the Bible was a swashbuckling adventurer from the proud Basque country of northern Spain. So, this uh, chapter that I just read all leads up, as you can probably see, to the founding of the so-called Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits. And we will be dealing with that in our next uh, part of the reading, because the next chapter is called Appointment at Cyrus, and very interesting. But um, I advise you all to get a little bit into this Medici family, and study a little bit on them, and what they stand for, and how they became what they are today, even though that you will not find uh, anything in the, of course, mainstream uh, media. <laughs> they do not know the Medicis. <laughs> no, they will not tell you anything about this. But I hope that you understood how even at that time Martin Luther understood how that learning against learning will be used to take God out of the equation. And Surely they did. For example, in the United States of America in 1963, they took the morning prayer out of the schools. And that leaves God out of, the, uh, out of the school system, out of the education system. And as, quote, as, as, as Luther uh, rightly quoted, he said, every institution, so not only the schools, but also the universities and higher offices of learning, Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. Now, look around you in the world today and compare what is happening everywhere around to the word of God, to the Bible. And haven't his word come true? I think Luther was very right at this point. And I thank Tapa Saucy for bringing this out in this wonderful book where we are learning more and more about the people who rule all the people in the world. And they are nowadays quite easy to rule because they are kept dumb. And that is exactly what happened during the Dark Ages that I referred to a little bit earlier when people were illiterate. They couldn't study anything on their own, and they had to believe everything the priest told them from their pulpits. And they couldn't compare it to the Word of God. But today the people who are rule are counting on our laziness. The laziness to educate ourselves in the things that are important. And that's why they are so successful. The Roman Catholic Church feeds on ignorance. And that's the last point I wanted to make today. Okay, I'll leave it hereby. I hope you enjoyed the reading of the chapter 3 and 4 of the book Rule of Evil. I advise you to go to my YouTube channel, Drogla66, for regular updates if you're not subscribed. Check out the playlist that is also put in here. And uh, Walt Stickle has made a wonderful website just dealing with... Um, with the reading of Rulers of Evil, and the link of that website will also be put in the description box of the video here. 
So, thank you very much for your attention. Until the next time, God bless you. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.